Janelle Benjamin is intensely focused on helping companies and employers build an inclusive and diverse work culture where individuals with disabilities and other minority groups have their opinions valued and have equal opportunities for career advancement. She's the founder of All Things Equitable, a new Toronto-based consulting firm which addresses all workplace inequalities for historically marginalized groups. It goes beyond diversity and inclusion and offers creative solutions to employee engagement, leadership development, and education. What sets it upon from other diversity and inclusion firms is that they have a full and thorough understanding of human rights law, equity, barriers towards inclusion, and they take an interdisciplinary approach to implementing systemic change. Benjamin joined me this week to discuss her mission to implement a fully cooperative and inclusive work culture. I'm Kevin McShan, a led to this conversation. But Janelle, if you're ready, I'll uh, welcome you to the program, and I'm excited to talk to you about all things equitable this morning. Great to be with you, and uh, th thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much, Kevin. I appreciate the invitation to come and share and express, you know, my love for the disability community. Absolutely. And just before we dive into uh, our conversation this morning, I'm curious to get your thoughts, you know, March is International Women's History Month. So I'm mm -hmm. curious to get your thoughts on the impact women have had in your life and uh, the role that you're hoping to blaze for young women as well. I love that question. And I'm, um, I'm glad that you asked me that because uh, I can't think of um, you know, more significant people in my life um, than the women in my life. Of course, starting with my mother and all that she's um, instilled in me, the values um, for justice and equity and appreciation of, of others and other cultures, you know, exposing me to other cultures has been really significant in my life. Um, you know, I've got, a, I've got a sister, I've got aunts, I've got cousins, you know, um, the women of my, my family are, are all, you know, trailblazers and powerful. There's entrepreneurs and, of course, Akua Benjamin, who is um, the first academic scholar uh, globally to introduce the concept of anti-Black racism to the academic community. So I come from good stock and, um, you know, all of these women have really... Uh, paved the way for me to do the work that I do. And I'm, I'm proud of uh, my lineage, my heritage on both sides of the family. It's, it's a wonderful group of women that I'm a part of. I asked Benjamin how she believes that she's giving a voice to all people of all abilities and backgrounds through her new initiative, her consulting firm, All Things Equitable. Thank you so much for that question, Kevin. Yeah, so I've set up this consultancy. It's a management consulting firm, um, and it's designed predominantly to work with organizations on the management side to address workplace inequities for people from all walks of life, um, including people with disabilities. So if you're a woman, you're LGBTQ+, you are you know, a, a newcomer to Canada, um, our firm helps to address those issues. And of course, there are people with intersecting um, identities. And so some, you can be, you know, a newcomer 
uh, female or woman with a disability, right? And so um, we, we address uh, inequities from an intersectional lens um, to ensure that people are treated fairly equitably, that barriers are broken in the workplace at a systemic level. So um, we review systems, we review policies, we work, re work really closely with organizational leaders to transform cultures and practices to ensure uh, fairness and equity at the roots. Uh, fabulous, and I also know that you uh, know all about the A AODA, and I'm wondering your thoughts on how far we've come in implementing it across, across the province and how far we still need to go. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, through my work at the Accessibility Directorate, um, you know, I was really, really proud to contribute to the uh, provincial landscape in terms of uh, setting standards and developing policies for people with disabilities and advising employers on their um, obligations under the legislation. Um, I also did the same work, similar work um, inside of a regional municipality working closely with an accessibility advisory committee. You know, I've, I've you know, encountered the Honorable David Onley through my work. Um, and I'm so uh, pleased at uh, a lot of the progress that the province has made toward um, accessibility, uh, of course, you know, developing the accessibility standards in um, the key areas of daily living, like customer service, of course, the design of public spaces, you know, transportation, um, employment and information and communications. And, uh, you know, the great work that they, they were undertaking to develop um, three new health, uh, three new standards um, for healthcare, uh, education for uh, kindergartners, eight, uh, from kindergarten to grade 12, and as well, um, standards for uh, post-secondary education and how to be as inclusive as possible for people with disabilities. Um, you know, they've developed programs like their ena enabling change program. You know, you mentioned the discoverability network um, you know, there's an, an entirely new framework for launching Accessibility Ontario. There's so much great things that have been done um, to uh, ensure compliance with uh, the standards across the province of Ontario. Um, but of course, we know that more work certainly needs to be done. So I'm not sure how close they are to, to meeting their goal. I do know that, you know, what they set out to do to achieve accessibility um, it was groundbreaking, you know, no other jurisdiction, I think, globally has advanced accessibility as much as we have here in Ontario, but certainly there's a lot further that, need, you know, that they can possibly go and that needs to be done. Certainly, you know, the, the new standards um, that are still in development um, is a great start towards accessibility. We know that in the design of public spaces, for example, um, organizations that were um, new builds, uh, or moving into new spaces had to ensure accessibility compliance. However, there was no obligation for retrofitting um, older establishments. And so that's a gap in the legislation that can still be addressed. There's still uh, significant barriers um, in uh, the design of public spaces uh, for people with disabilities, but parks and recreation facilities um, have you know, improved by leaps and bounds, right? Curb cuts in sidewalks and uh, communication on public transportation. There's been so much great work done. Um, and I think it's incumbent on all of us to, to do our part to ensure full inclusive inclusion for people with all types of disabilities, right? We talk a lot about, um, you know, wheelchair users, but for example, not as much as is known or done for people with um, learning disabilities or low vision or, um, or even hearing loss, right? There's a lot of, of, um, invisible disabilities that people also have, cognitive impairments, et cetera, that need to be also addressed and considered by employers as they, they work to include people in their, their workspaces. Absolutely. And, you know, Janelle, I live my life by saying that I, I've sort of coined inclusion is the gateway to independence. So I, I'm curious to get your thoughts uh, more broadly on the progress that we've made in, in promoting equitable and inclusive employment opportunities uh, for individuals with disabilities in all minority groups. And I'm wondering also your thoughts on the power of education or the importance of education and educating the 
employment community on the benefits of hiring people with disabilities as well? Thank you so much for that question, Kevin. Um, I do my part for sure to ensure that, you know, every client that I work with considers um, accessibility in everything that they do. When I'm invited to speak uh, for a presentation, for example, I always ask whether or not their accessibility needs um, of the, the people that are there. Do they need uh, cart services, for example, uh, live transcription? Do they need, uh, is there anybody that requires uh, alt tags on the images that I present? Um, so I think it's incumbent on each, every single one of us to um, drive the conversation as much as, as we possibly can. I think education is key and critical to uh, breaking those barriers for people in the workplace, um, reducing the glass ceiling and really appreciating that people with disabilities um, have abilities and that they can do um, everything that an, you know, a quote unquote able-bodied person can do in the workplace if given the opportunity. And so certainly um, you know, through organizations like the Rick Hansen Foundation, um, you know, organizations can get certified to, you know, demonstrate their commitment to um, improving accessibility in the workplace and, and breaking those barriers to employment for people with disabilities. You know, the province has mandated those, um, those statements that go out in job postings at the bottom that, you know, ensures that all organizations or workplaces will comply with the AODA. Um, you know, they, they have requirements for their, their website in which to post their accessibility policies. Um, and most organizations now of a certain size will have accessibility co coordinators leads and accessibility advisory committees. So I think that's a great start to keep uh, or, uh, employers cognizant of their obligations. But I also think that more needs to be done in terms of, like you said, hiring people with disabilities because um, truly seeing the value that people bring to the table uh, needs to be a greater conversation. Uh, greater awareness certainly can be brought to that conversation um, through organizations and through people like yourself and through this conversation, um, you know, by sharing it widely, people can learn and understand um, that it's, it's an untapped community, right? It, and that there is, um, you know, as we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, we cannot, we certainly can't forget people with disabilities. And uh, Janelle, I know that you've worked in um, re regulation and the nonprofit sector since the early, early to mid 2000s. So I'm curious to know what's been the uh, biggest impact on you personally on the work that you've done? The biggest impact personally and professionally for me, I would say uh, certainly my work with the accessibility advisory committee. Um, I think when you work alongside people with disabilities, you can appreciate, and a variety of disabilities, you can appreciate a lot more um, the, the barriers that they face, the challenges that they face. Um, you learn a lot more about how to accommodate people with disabilities. And I think that appreciation and awareness can only make us more um, humane and good. And, um, and so I, I really, really loved my time um, at York Region working with the Accessibility Advisory Committee. Um, I got to meet people with a, you know, a range of disabilities from you know, cognitive impairments and you know, total blindness and um, you know, even just uh, people who were wheelchair bound because of um, strokes. Uh, and things like that. Um, and so it, it really changed my perspective. I learned a lot about how to present information to them. I learned a lot about how to include them in conversations. I learned a lot about just the, the value, the unique value and perspective that they bring. Um, for example, through certain reviews of, of uh, programs and property services, you know, you learned a lot about, you know, what we, we would be designing in terms of a, a retrofit of a new space and we thought that was the most inclusive. And then you, you heard from the diverse perspectives around the table about, you know, perhaps how high the sign should be or where should the braille be for an elevator button or, you know, how to ensure that, you know, the design or layout of even a curb cut outside of the building for entry can um, be designed in, in, a, in a better way to suit somebody uh, with, a, with a, a disability. Learned about, you know, washroom sizes and doorways and all of that um, 
interesting, very interesting and important information that can ensure the full participation of people. And so, yeah, that was, I would say the most impactful time for me was definitely, definitely that experience and exposure. Um, and then of course I've worked alongside um, people with disabilities, even in the accessibility directorate. And truthfully, it was the only time I, I ever have in my career, at least knowingly worked alongside with people with um, uh, visible disabilities, right? Um, at the accessibility directorate, there was um, a woman there who um, I believe she was totally deaf and she, she tended to lip read, um, but she, she also couldn't hear. And so, you know, I learned a lot about, you know, how do we ensure her safety in the workplace, right? Health and safety is a big, uh, big concern. Um, for employers and they're scared about how to hire people with disabilities because they think it's going to be so costly to include them and really um, all she needed was to ensure that there was um, adequate uh, smoke detection right that the smoke detectors responded in a certain way so that if there was a fire in the building that she could be alerted and there was no other accommodation really um, that needed to be to be made and so I think it's just incumbent on all of us to educate, like you said, teach organizations how to include people and let them realize that truthfully that the there isn't uh, that uh, cost, it's not so cost prohibitive as they might expect or think to, um, to include people with disabilities in the workplace. Absolutely, I'll tell you, we did a, uh, uh, when I worked at the uh, Ontario Chamber of Commerce, we found that 80% of accommodations for folks with disabilities uh, cost less than $500. So uh, <laughs> it can uh, certainly be done if you're motivated to, to do it, for sure. Absolutely. And, and you know, I'm, I'm curious to know your, th your thoughts on how, how we'll know uh, when tangible progress has been made in the field of the diversity, equity, and inclusion. How will we know? I think we'll know when we have visible representation of disability at all levels and we can look to a c-suite you know to a board of directors and you can see people with disabilities with visible disabilities around the table right um i think then we'll know when people are um represented you know at all levels i think there's no other way except to, to say that we actually need to see um people with disabilities included uh, throughout organizations of all types, all sizes, all sectors, you know, in all uh, fields of endeavor, you know, from science to arts and culture, music, dance, you know, you name it, um, leading the charge, uh, driving the change, um, you know, contributing to the fullest extent, I think then we'll know. Um I'm curious to know, Janelle, when you're not working, how do you like to reconnect with yourself and uh, what do you like to do for fun? Wow. Well, I'm in the startup phase of my, my, my practice, my consulting firm. So there isn't a lot of time for fun. A lot of what I do is, um, you know, when I'm working on weekends, I'm working late at night. Um, but, you know, when I do need that reprieve, um, which is really, really important, you know, to take those mental health breaks, um, I go for walks, I spend time with my kids, you know, I just play with them, I read with them, you know, there's that I do. I read a lot. Um, so I'm, I'm always reading something um, in my off time, in my downtime. Um, and then I just play Scrabble. <laughs> I love Scrabble. It's like I have an, an app on my phone and, you know, I play with people from all over the world just to keep my brain sharp. I might play Sudoku, you know, just to help me relax the mind and fall asleep. And I love Candy Crush, you know, so I'm, you know, I'm Candy Crushing. <laughs> I'm candy crushing and playing Scrabble when I'm not reading or, you know, just trying to do something mindless like, you know, watch Netflix and, uh, you know, learn something new about diversity, equity, and inclusion. But that's pretty much what I do. <laughs> I got you. Well, I'll tell you one of one of the reasons I started this podcast is um, um, I, I told myself that there was only so much Netflix I could watch in a day, right? So uh, I, I needed something to put my creative energy into so I can relate in that perspective. And I'm, I'm curious to also ask you as a, um, uh, as a female entrepreneur, how uh, excited you, you are about the inroads that you're making for other uh, female entrepreneurs and women of color as well. 
I hope that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm blazing a trail and doing something um, impactful, but there's so many um, women entrepreneurs and women of color in this space um, by necessity, right? Precisely because we haven't been included in workplaces ourselves. Um, we've been, you know, categorically ex excluded and systematically excluded um, in some cases. And so um, I hope that I'm inspiring. I hope people can see um, you know, my efforts and hard work. Um, I'm, I'm really active on LinkedIn. Um, I'm, you know, moving into new social channels like Instagram and Facebook. And, um, you know, I'm really, really working hard. So I, I would hope that I'm, you know, inspiring uh, other women, other women of color to do the same thing, to, you know, believe in themselves. You've got the skills, you've got the talent, you've got the knowledge, um, you know, just contribute uh, in, your, in your unique way. And the best to the best of your ability in terms of in terms of equal representation we talked about that for uh people with disabilities but i'm also uh interested to get your thoughts on the same question for women as well because i know uh for uh, specifically a uh, youth whether you're a woman or or a girl or a boy equal representation and if you see someone that looks like you you're more uh, likely to go into that certain career path so i'm curious to get your thoughts on equal rep representation for all minority groups as well um, I think it is so critically important. And I think it's it's precisely why I started All Things Equitable. I felt that there's definitely a gap in the marketplace in terms of organizations doing something to benefit all equity seeking groups. Um, and I think, um, you know, you see different organizations that will pop up and they're concentrating on people with disabilities, or they're focusing their efforts on the LGBTQ plus community, or they're a women's advocacy group. Um, but I, th I think, you know, you can't care about justice and equality and equity without ensuring that it's equity for all, it's justice for all. Um, all equity seeking groups, all of humanity is important. And so, um, through my work to, you know, ensure even people with, who are newcomers, people who are religious minorities, um, you know, we don't talk enough about, uh, you know, people who are parents, people who are, um, you know, uh, you're, you're either a parent or you are um, a newcomer to Canada, you are, have, you've got foreign qualifications, you might even actually be Canadian with foreign qualifications, but you're met with barriers and challenges and through my work and through my practice, I hope to address all of those types of inequities just um, based on my skills and experiences, not only at the accessibility director, but also at the fairness commissioner. Um, you know, I've seen a lot in terms of uh, how to implement legislation, how to develop standards, how to break barriers, how to um, amend requirements uh, and bylaws and change practices and cultures in order to facilitate the entry um, and access to, to, to a variety of professions um, for people from all walks of life. And so, I think it's critically important and it's precisely why I started this company up. Absolutely. And I'm curious to get your thoughts on a final message you would have for employers and uh, about the importance of fully including uh, people with disabilities. You know, when I worked in the space, I always told employers it, it, it only takes one opportunity uh, to change a life of someone with a disability or all minority groups. So I'm wondering your message to employers about the importance of diversity. I think diversity, you know, we say in Toronto, it's our strength, right? I think employers have to truly understand uh, that we are better when we're working together collaborating cohesively when all parts of our society um, are represented in your organization when everybody can thrive and participate innovation happens um you know it's it's profitable right we've got re reports and studies now that uh, that demonstrate um how diverse teams drive um revenue um, they, you know, increase in innovation. And I think it's just, it's just, like I said, it's just the humane thing to do. And so 
um, my advice would just be to um, give everyone a chance, give everyone an, an equal opportunity, look around your organization, see who's represented, see who's not represented, and then put something in place strategically to ensure that those people um, are also represented in your workplace, right? So if, if it is you look around your workplace and you don't see people with disabilities, do something targeted, do something focused, um, reach out to organizations um, to ensure that, uh, that those people are around the table, right? You've got um, different organizations like the Discoverability Network that can help you um, ensure that people of disability, with disabilities are included um, and again, you don't know what you don't know, right? If you don't have the perspectives of those with lived experience in your organization um, at the table, um, then you are, you, you, you've got blind spots, right? There's going to be things you absolutely don't know. Um, you will not be providing adequate service to the community if you're in a service-oriented industry, if it is that you don't actually understand the community and you don't know how to support them. So it's, it's really important. Thanks for that question. You're absolutely welcome. And I'm uh, wanting to get your thoughts also on your message uh, to job seekers, because, you know, a lot of the work that I did when I worked with the network was uh, helping people understand if they disclose that they have a disability or mm -hmm. some form of, of, of impairment. I always try to help them understand if you tell them, tell them up front uh, that you have a disability, uh, that the employer can um, help, help you uh, sort of uh, alleviate or eliminate some of the barriers uh, towards inclusion. So I'm wondering uh, your thoughts on a disclosure for uh, job seekers with a disability. Honestly, I have mixed opinions about this, Kevin, because, you know, the research shows us that where people disclose their disability up front, um, they are less likely to be hired, right? And so I would say it's sort of like, you know, where microaggressions are happening in the workplace. You call it out if it's safe to do so. So I would say, you know, you have to assess the inclusion uh, efforts of the organization that you're you're aspiring to work for. If it is that you feel that this is a, an organization that is really um, walking the talk and they really believe in, in diversity, equity, and inclusion, definitely open um, open up your your heart and your your mouth and, and and advise them of your accessibility needs because that's the best way for you to be supported and accommodated um, through the um, recruitment process, hiring, onboarding, promotion, you you name it, right? Um, so I think it's in, in those cases where you've assessed the organization and you know that they're the most fair and inclusive organization, certainly disclosing is your best option. However, if you're not sure if people with disabilities have ever been included in the, in the workplace, you're not sure if the perception is that you're going to be welcome or well received, um, and, and disclosing your disability isn't necessary to get you through the recruitment process, then perhaps you might consider disclosing it later when it is safer to do so. Um, there's a lot of people with disabilities that um, their disability is not impacting uh, them through the recruitment process. So they don't necessarily need to, but if it is like right now during COVID times, you know, we're all, most of us are working from home, for example. So if you're a person with disability and you're a wheelchair, wheelchair user, for example, and you don't actually have to physically go to the to the, the facility for an interview, you might consider not disclosing that you have a disability at this time, because you know there you don't have to consider how am I getting in the building? How am I getting? Is the elevator you know? Is there an elevator that's working? Is it functioning? Can I actually you know get to the room where the the meeting is going to be held? Is there a washroom that can accommodate me? All of those things that go into planning the person's day, they don't they no longer have to think about. So disclosing it might actually impede um, their ability to be hired in the job. And maybe they need to disclose it later when the office opens and they can they can go in. So I, again, I'm mixed about it, um, Kevin, only because we know from the data that when people disclose their disability, they're less likely to be hired, um, which is so problematic. I really wish um, we were in a different world in which people could freely uh, and openly say um, that they have a disability and, and know that they would be supported. I really wish organizational leaders um, would live their accessibility statements and truly um, commit to supporting people with disabilities through the process. But um, 
we've seen evidence that that isn't necessarily so. So I would say again, disclose it if it's safe to do so, disclose it if you absolutely need to, because it's important to the hiring, um, to your hiring through the, and, and what you need um, through the recruitment process. Um, but if you can withhold the information, my advice would be to people with disabilities, you know, for example, if you've got an invisible disability, um, if you don't need to disclose it, um, then don't do so. Like if you've got a reading disability and they're making you do some sort of written examination or something like that through the um, recruitment process, then you might need to disclose it because you need more time or what have you. Um, you've got dyslexia or, or something like that. Um, but if you absolutely don't need to disclose it, I would say don't do it. That's that's my advice and it's, it's sad advice. But um, until we get to a better world, a better state in which organizations um, truly um, walk the talk and um, understand how to accommodate with people with disabilities and not discriminate, right? You know, they might accommodate you, but you're not guaranteed that they're not going to um, use that against you in some way and, and um, deny your employment, um, then I wouldn't disclose it. Yeah, I tell you, uh, the uh, journey uh, for full inclusion, I always tell people, is a never-ending journey and a constant battle of, of, of passion for me, because I think uh, once you break down barriers, there's still more work to do. So there's always work to do in this space for sure. And I'm i uh, curious uh, to finally ask you if people want to get connected with you through all things equitable, uh, what's the best way they can do that? So I am on all major platforms. I am all things equitable on Instagram and Facebook. I am JB underscore equitable on Twitter. I'm just Janelle Benjamin on LinkedIn. And of course, I've got an all things equitable page on LinkedIn as well. And then my website is uh, all things equitable dot CA. So and uh, fantastic, you know, really enjoyed our discussion on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Really want to thank you for being here today. It's most appreciated. I know we have a, a, a similar passion for the, the, this work. So I really want to thank you for uh, providing your uh, insights and perspectives today. It's most appreciated. Thank you so much, Kevin. I really, really appreciated the invitation. It is a, a community that is close to my heart and I appreciate the invitation.